Welcome to Shooting Straight from AMNF.com. I'm Frank Miniter, the Editor-in-Chief of the NRA's America's First Freedom. Today we have the incredible pleasure of sitting down with John Lott, the President and Founder of the Crime Prevention Research Center, author of More Guns, Less Crime, and a very busy researcher, and Wikipedia likes to call you a gun rights advocate. The media likes to call you controversial, and they like to call you a debunked researcher. Why are they so afraid of you, John? Uh, you know, I don't know. I guess you'll have to ask them, but you know, it, it does irritate me. I'm not a gun rights advocate. Uh, I try to go where the data goes. My views have changed a lot over time. I think the reason why they want to label me like that is uh, they don't label uh, the academics on the other side of the debate, you know, gun control advocates or whatever. It wants they want to make it look like somehow I'm biased uh, in terms of the research that I do to discredit in different ways. Back around like 98 through the early 2000s, I used to have a published fairly regularly in the Los Angeles Times, maybe three or four times a year. And uh, uh, Nick Goldberg, who was kind of the second op-ed editor that I had to deal with there, um, he would tell me that when he'd run one of my pieces, they'd get like 10 times more emails and what have you than they'd get for anybody else. Uh, you know, many of them from gun control advocates uh, kind of organized. And, uh, but he said he didn't mind, you know, that uh, it, people were at least noticing it and what have you. But then when they weren't getting a response from him, they started going to the publisher. And the publisher, uh, would call him into his office and he says, John, I just don't have the time to go and spend an hour in the afternoon explaining to the publisher why we published your piece, uh, you know, every time I run one of your pieces. And so they stopped taking my pieces. Uh, and it's pretty much been the same strategy they've used at other places. I don't know, I probably published over 100 op-eds in the Philadelphia Inquirer over the decades. I used to have a monthly column when I was at Wharton. And... Uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, the same things happened there, same things happened at the Hill. Uh, other places where I've had regular columns, uh, you know, they just bombard them with uh, demands that they stop publishing my piece, often with like no content. I say, you know, if they disagree, say why they disagree or whatever. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's their view is they'd rather kind of make it so nobody can hear your voice rather than going and have to explain why you're wrong on something. They can't win the policy debate, so they're shutting you down. Right. Which is a disservice to all of us because the policy debate might bring better policy if it was honest. Well, I think so. But, uh, but <clears throat> I mean, the same things happen in academia and what have you, so it's not, uh, media is not particularly unique. I mean, one of the things that you've seen generally in media is that you wouldn't have seen 20 or 30 years ago is uh, there used to be this ethic in reporting that you'd go and talk to people on both sides of the issue. Uh, that's not what you see anymore. Uh, what you see is that, um, uh, you know, you'll see lots of stories in the New York Times and Washington Post where they only interview people on one side of the issue. Now, they could still bias it. Uh, in my book, The Bias Against Guns, uh, I point out that the New York Times, for example, when they would go and do uh, articles on some new studies dealing with guns, you know, first they'd only do articles on studies that claimed that gun control was good. But then they would interview people on both sides, but they would have like uh, some academics who say this was a wonderful uh, study pro gun control. And then they'd have a gun dealer and the NRA uh, on the other side. And they could say, well, we got people on both sides. But my guess is kind of the average neutral reader would go and say, well, you know, these academics say it's good. Uh, the gun dealer really doesn't know anything about the study per se. He just says he doesn't really believe it. But, you know, why am I going to believe uh, the gun dealer? And then the NRA uh, often wouldn't comment, but they'd say we reached out and what have you. So it's just, uh, um, you know, and in any case, even when they would comment, uh, the media, you know, I'm sure most people would discount them relative to an academic. True. I mean, not that they should or anything, but I'm just telling you that uh, that's the reason. So they're, even when they would go and do both sides, there are still ways that they could go and bias the stuff. This is why I mostly blame the media for separating us in this country, not bringing us together the way they're supposed to. Oh, yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. So to shift gears a little bit, 
on constitutional carry, concealed carry. 25 states now have constitutional carry. And uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida says he's moving fast to making that a constitutional carry state. Nebraska looks very likely now. Right. So as a researcher, a uh, preeminent researcher in this field, what does that do to you as you're measuring the data to see how many people are carrying and use, utilizing this right? Right. Well, I mean, there, it has different effects on the research. I mean, uh, the more states adopting constitutional carry in more different years, the more you can kind of disentangle all the different changes that are happening and see what the impact from constitutional carry is. I have to say, I kind of view constitutional carry as a continuation of a trend. You go back to 96 in Texas, for example, um, it, 10 hours training to get your permit initially, an additional 10 hours to renew it, $140 cost, 30 some places that were listed as gun-free zones. And gradually over time, you know, the permit fee went from 140 down to 40, the training went from 10 to three to four and removing the uh, uh, training requirement for renewal. Uh, you know, every couple of years you'd have a reduction of one or two gun-free zones that would be there. And uh, so this is just a continuation of a trend. You know, they're, to me, they're both pluses and minuses for constitutional carry. Uh, the one benefit that I've seen for uh, concealed carry is you can go and deal with a lot of objections to civilians carrying guns. So, for example, gun control people say, well, it's dangerous letting people go and carry guns. And, but with, cons con with permits, you're able to say, well, here, you know, we have... 22 and a half million permits in the United States. And you can see how many people have their permits revoked for any reason. You know, it's tiny, tiny fraction. How many of them are convicted of firearms related violations? You're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of one percentage point, a rate that's even lower than police officers are convicted of firearms offenses. And that, and you know, for years, the Violence Policy Center would put out a list that was often mistake filled about number of crimes committed by permit holders. Um, and I was able, you know, the New York Times would repeat it endlessly. Uh, you know, I'd write letters to the New York Times, the Washington Post, which was kind of useless. They would never do it. I just would say, look, you know, first of all, there are errors in what they're doing. Uh, they're double or triple or even quadruple counting some cases. So like in Michigan, they would go and have news stories and then they would go and have uh, the Michigan State Police report and they would, and anyway, I won't go through it, but it's just a real mess. But even if you take their numbers, you got to divide it by the number of people who are carrying, and you're talking about still a low rate. And, uh, uh, and so having permits allows you to kind of address those types of concerns. On the other hand, um, one of the problems with permits is, let's say you're a woman who's being stalked or threatened. Uh, you know, in a state like Connecticut, uh, it can take two months or even a year to kind of go through the first stage where local government makes an approval for whether you have the permit. Uh, and then you have the state has to go and make the approval. Uh, you know, uh, a woman who's being stalked may not have two months, let alone a year, to be able to wait before she's able to go and defend herself. Now, there are other ways you can go and solve that problem. You could go and say a woman who has an order of protection and is waiting for a permit to be approved should be able to go and carry, kind of constitutional carry light or something like that. Uh, you know, but you also have the fees and other things. And in, uh, in Illinois, if you add uh, the permit fee of $150 and the training, which costs, uh, which is 16 hours, which can run, you know, 250 or $300 for the training. Uh, including the live fire. I'm hearing prices of $800 in New York now for the training they just mandated through the concealed carry. Yeah. Right. Well, who, who are they stopping from doing that? If my research convinces me of anything, it's poor minorities who live in high crime urban areas. You make them $800, you make them $350, you make them $450, mm -hmm. you're making it so that those people who need it the most can't get it. Um, you know, there may be ways you could go and solve that. You could go and say, okay, people who are, you know, lower income, uh, maybe get permits for free or something like that. But Democrats will fight you tooth and nail. When, when Texas lowered its uh, permitting fee from $140 to $40, the Republicans pretty much voted unanimously in favor of the, reducing the fees. The Democrats pretty much unanimously voted against it. 
And you see that time after time. They claim that they care about the poor, but you know, uh, when it actually comes to actually kind of putting their votes on the line there, they aren't very helpful. Right, I hate putting party affiliation that way, but unfortunately that's what it's become. Uh, because there are Democrats who believe in our right to bear arms. Um, and maybe not many few, politicians. Anymore. Not many right now. It's, it's uh, even in Montana, where I live, uh, the Democrat Party, uh, we, I helped put together an event for the Montana Sports Shooting Association. And I can't tell you how many Democrats we reached out to to go and speak at the event. You know, Tester wouldn't speak. Uh, other Democrats wouldn't speak. Uh, you know, it's... They claim, uh, some of them still, like Tester, will still claim rhetoric that they uh, support the Second Amendment. But, you know, you look at the judges that they go and put on the courts. You look at, you know, voting for the ATF director and other types of things. It's kind of hard to go and square that, even with the one, the, the couple that still have that rhetoric that's there. They don't follow through. Well, I remain hopeful, especially with all the new gun owners that have joined. I would assume uh, some interesting percentage of that are Democrats. Oh, I hope so, and I believe so, and I believe, look, uh, you know, uh, if you look at concealed carry permits, uh, the growth rate for blacks getting concealed carry permits over the last decade has been about twice the growth rate for whites. Uh, you know, blacks overwhelmingly vote for Democrats, and yet, uh, you know, maybe this will hopefully create one of those wedge issues within the party. Either the party changes a tiny bit or, uh, or at least becomes a little bit more open uh, to these things again, uh, or they lose some of those voters. Shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's a, it's well, a basic I agree. civil right. Absolutely. I mean, as I say, the, a lot of the people who benefit are people who regularly vote, benefit the most are the ones who vote heavily for Democrats. So I, I hate to think of guys like us as cultural warriors here, because we're, you're digging up the truth, you're a renowned researcher doing that, and I'm, I'm, I'm journalistic, he's just trying to print the truth in America's First Freedom. Um, but I kind of feel like we are, in, in some respect, given how the climate in this country has gotten to. Um, but I'm still hopeful, and I'm wondering how you feel about the future, given that more people are practicing this right than ever before. Right. I mean, obviously, there's been a big increase in gun sales, and it's been a changing demographics. A lot more women are getting concealed carry permits. Their growth rate also has been about twice per men. Uh, and I'm glad to see that because it's those are the types of groups who, who I think benefit the most. Um, the problem I see just in terms of the future is uh, the left controls the universities, the left controls K through 12, the left controls the media. Uh, I was just working the federal government up until January 2021, and, uh, you know, the deep state is pretty real. You and I have talked about it before. Uh, I can go and give war stories about it, and, uh, um, you know, I worked in the federal government in the 1980s, uh, and uh, the civil service was overwhelmingly Democrats, but if you pointed out data errors, people would fix it. Uh, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, you, they'll, it's like dragging somebody across broken glass to get them to go and fix things. And uh, I had numerous debates and fights with people at the FBI on data uh, when I was there. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it's gotten to the point where um, I just don't believe a lot of the data that the FBI puts out. Uh, their active shooting reports are horribly done. And even when uh, you point out errors to them, they don't fix it. So, for example, with regard to that, um, the FBI, from 2014 to 2021, the FBI claims that there's 252 active shooting attacks in the United States. These are attacks where a gun's fired in public, uh, not involving some other type of crime. It could be anything from one person being targeted and missed all the way up to a mass public shooting. They claim that only 11 of those uh, were stopped by s civilians carrying permanent concealed handguns. I think there's 360 of these cases, and I think 124 were stopped. So rather than 4%, I think it's 34%. But I didn't have the millions of dollars that the FBI spent on putting that together. Uh, I literally had a few thousand dollars. And, um, you know, I, I'm more confident about the later years' data 
And in, uh, in 2021, about 49% of the active shooting cases were stopped by civilians legally carrying guns. It's a long way from 4%. Wow. And one of the arguments I tried to have with the FBI, which they would have nothing to do with, is that you have to separate out places where people are legally allowed to carry from gun-free zones. You can't expect law-abiding citizens to stop active shooting cases in places where they're banned from having guns. Uh, if you do that, in 2021, about almost 60% of the active shooting cases were stopped by civilians illegally carrying concealed handguns. Wow. So, you know, um, but the media uses these bogus FBI reports after the, uh, after the Greenwood Mall shooting uh, in Indianapolis this last summer. Uh, you know, within a day, you had the Associated Press. Within two days, you had the New York Times and Washington Post come out with stories about, well, you know, this virtually never happens. You shouldn't really try to depend upon This is where uh, Elijah this, Dickens. Yeah, this young 22-year-old uh, saved many lives. This, uh, this attacker had something like 120 rounds of ammunition still available to him when he was stopped. So, um, uh, but, you know, I couldn't get the FBI to fix it, and, uh, I and I've given them uh, many of these examples over many years, and nobody needs to take my word for it. You know, the, no police department collects this data, so the FBI essentially paid for new searches to be done. Uh, I've done a new search. I have links to the underlying news stories on our website at crimeresearch.org. Nobody needs to take my word for it. They can go and check it, read themselves, see whether they're are cases as I claim that they are. And, uh, but, you know, um, uh, the media doesn't care to check and the uh, FBI sure as hell is not going to fix it. Right. There are some parts of the media that do, um, but. Well, no, but not don't. mainstream. I'm talking about mainstream media. I understand. I agree. And, and that's where most people get their news from. Uh, you know, somebody, uh, when we did a study about a year and a half ago. Uh, if you look at the five largest newspapers, the New York Times, the LA Times, Washington Post, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, uh, between them, they had a total of 10 defensive gun use stories bet between all five of them. Almost all of them had something go wrong. Either the wrong person was shot or the gun was taken away from somebody. By contrast, they had 1,700 and some news stories about somebody being killed or wounded in a criminal uh, offense. They had over 2,700 gun crime stories in general. Um, you had in CNN and MSNBC, they had zero defensive gun use stories during that period of time. So you could be somebody who considers yourself following the news regularly. You read all the major publications that are there. You watch the TV news on those two outlets. And you come away with the notion that uh, there are lots of gun crimes. You may never even hear about see the 10 stories between those five papers. Uh, but even if you do, something goes wrong with them. And so you think, well, you know, why not ban guns? Because uh, maybe we'll cut back on some of these crimes and we don't really lose anything because there's no defensive gun uses that are useful anyway. And uh, so you can't really blame people for having the views that they do uh, for a lot of people on the left. And, uh, you know, somehow... We have to break through that and, uh, and educate people on it. But I'm not sure how to do that because uh, the overwhelmingly bias in the media and, uh, and academia and, and the government. It's pretty hard to see how one's going to change that. We're in a civil rights struggle here. But um, I think a majority of Americans are with us. I think it's just bringing them... Well, I think, if you, gave them, if, I think yeah. if you gave them accurate facts and information, I think you'd easily win. That's the reason why there's so much disinformation that's out there. Right. So, John, where can people find you, follow you? Well, they can. our website is crimeresearch.org, crimeresearch.org, and pretty much everything we've talked about and a lot more is there. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.